Okay, uh, single speaker calibration today and um, just going to look at the differences really in the response from calibrating a single speaker versus calibrating um, a left and right speaker and averaging the response to get an output that tracks close to a Harman target curve. Uh, the difference is actually quite significant. It's actually very significant. Um, I didn't think it would be uh, so, such a large difference, but it, it honestly is. Um, and it's changed the way I've uh, thought essentially about this calibration now. Um, you know, you, you think you know uh, almost everything there is to, to know about calibration and then you try an individual speaker calibration and it clears up a lot of issues. Um, one movie, um, Bohemian Rhapsody, um, I was having issues with brightness. I felt that the movie itself just sounded too bright. And um, one of the issues with that is when you uh, calibrate as an average response, um, if there's certain sections here, for example, um, this is say the right front, the right front is actually slightly brighter uh, than my uh, left speaker. And this was after a correction that took place. I had to correct for this as well. So the result was actually higher than this uh, from the right speaker. So um, there are differences in the response. So what you would do is, or what I did, is then you average those um, and you would get this, right? That is now That now becomes the average response and um, you know you can generally now see what's going on as a pair um, even though there are small differences between them you get a general idea for what's uh, what's happening um, when you average them and EQ them together you know I was getting this response and I was extremely happy with it um, but again I was watching um, uh, the Queen movie uh, Bohemian Rhapsody and I felt that some of the songs on there just sounded too bright and um, really made my ears ring and um, that was when I started to look into different target curves uh, inadvertently I ran into well why don't I try calibrating now my speakers individually uh, because Odyssey I think Odyssey have had this now for a year at least, at least I think, and um, so which I'll just show you very quickly. Um, this is my current calibration. I'm not going to connect to the actual receiver uh, right now. Um, if you go to design target curve, yeah, you can now, um, you know, this is this has been for a while, but you can individually uh, calibrate your speakers now. And um, when this was first released, we didn't have access to this. You actually had to calibrate as a pair. And uh, if you go to, uh, let's say, the center speaker, um, probably not a good example. Let's go to a different one. Uh, the right channel. You know, you can just select this, this, uh, this target curve that I am importing here. This just applies to this channel. That's it. Right. Whereas before, again, I was combining responses for both channels and, you know, on average, it was when they both played, they did have that response. Um, I've now realized that is not uh, that is not the best way to make your speaker sound uh, good. Uh, I have another one open here. I don't know why. Yeah, it's not um, because, again, you're. Um, can you see that? Let's have a look. That's interesting, right? So calibrated, um, you know, when it's when they've been averaged, you can still see that um, you know the uh, right speaker here in blue is actually brighter than my left speaker. You know, this is this is calibrated, um, but when they're both being played, you know, that, that it's potentially did sound fine. But again, I noticed certain movies, again, that there was too much brightness here and something just didn't sound right with this. So this is why um, I think it's always good to have certain discs that you can test that aren't just bass discs, you know, 
I wouldn't consider a Bohemian Rhapsody a, a massive bass disc or anything like that, but it does test um, this range, I would say, this vocal range uh, here. It's definitely testing that. So, um, very interesting. Anyway, um, so shout out again to Obsessive Compulsive Audiophile. Um, he linked, uh, well, he, he made this video a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> And uh, it's got uh, Dolby Atmos uh, 9.1.6 lossless speaker measurement sweeps. And uh, it's linked in this video. I'll, I'll uh, link uh, his page here uh, if you want to check that out. Uh, he does uh, super advanced uh, calibration stuff. And uh, I've been learning from him really over the past two months, two to three months, um, and watching as many videos as I can really from him. Uh, but yeah, he, he now provided lossless sweeps, um, so yeah, before um, they were, you can inspect them here with Media Info just to see what they were and uh, you can see here they're Dolby Digital Plus, which means they are lossy and you can see here it's lossy. So these are not compressed, I mean these are compressed, um, but to be fair, to be 100% honest about this, the bit rates um, were, you know, one meg, right? Uh, one meg from just a sweep test is probably not going to make a huge difference, even in compression, even in compression. But there is um, a couple of things to say about um, lossy compression, is you can get ringing in treble, and sometimes bass is not as powerful as it is when it is lossless. So if there is any um, potential loss there, you know, now you are, now you get true, um, truly uncompressed. And uh, you can see here, you know, this is um, Meridian lossless packaging. This is this is what you find on a Dolby, uh, sorry, a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray. This is exactly the same. There is no difference here. Um, this is 24-bit 48. The compression mode is lossless. So if there's any thoughts of, you know, could this be an issue? This has been taken care of with this. Uh, the bit rates are 1.1 meg. Uh, again, now you're in this level of compression, um, which is essentially lossless, uh, you have perfect sweeps here, you know. Again, just in case there's any weird ringing going on with uh, lo lossy versions, um, you know how that, so, um, you know, uh, if, uh, if it does make a difference, at least we have the absolute bleeding edge best quality we can get uh, with these sweeps. Um, I've put some of the other speed, the other measurements for um, front um, wides and the top middles. I've put them in here because what I did is I literally went from center, you know, all the way down to um, top right, uh, top right, oh, top rear. Yeah, I just went. Sorry, <laughs> I just went in order, like all the way down. And it just kept things simple because then I knew where I'd been and I knew what I'd listened to last. The only speaker I didn't do is the subwoofer because um, I like to calibrate my system. Um, I like to calibrate my speakers together and do them all at once. And then the subwoofer calibration, you know, I did a, a separate day. And I prefer to keep them separate like that. Um, but if I had to do everything all on the same day, I would either do my subwoofer first or I would do it last. You know, it's that simple. I would not do them in between here because messing around with the sub is um, slightly more difficult uh, than doing these uh, than doing these other speakers. Once you get a rhythm for doing these, um, I finished in three hours, three or four hours. Uh, it took me to fully calibrate the entire system. And uh, yeah, you really need to like make time to do this, uh, but it is, it's, it's well worth it, you know. I, I, cause I said to myself, you know, I'm taking, I'm taking a day here 
and I'm calibrating my speakers fully uh, with everything now that I've learned and uh, yeah so yeah he provided the files um, I will leave a link in the description for his channel um, he does excellent work and uh, he really introduced me to this new method of um, inverting a target's response uh, compared to the speaker's response um, so I don't use EQ filters anymore um, I use a target uh, curve essentially so yeah so but yeah this is um, this is the actual response of each each speaker you know not bad right it's not bad but the thing is when you uh, psychoacoustically smooth anything these differences are now absolutely heard so when you're in a psychoacoustic um, smoothing scenario you want to get as absolute as tight as possible and um, you know any inconsistencies here you will hear so because that's what the model is based on you know it's based on our hearing and these little things here you can you can hear um, so uh, let's open a measurement full calibration is it that one uh, let's double check no full single speaker calibration okay um, front channels now um, <clears throat> I think I pressed the wrong button <laughs> I don't know if you've ever done this in REW instead of saving all measurements I only saved one measurement and uh, but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because I'm just showing you what you can achieve with a you know single speaker calibration anyway so uh, this doesn't really matter um, you know so um, target okay so yeah we can see that uh, it's relatively decent it is a little wavy we are tracking uh, high on this treble area and again this is this just for this reason this could be that's 1 dB right um, that is 1 dB's difference in this this area that is a little sensitive I feel to at least my ears um, here singing at very high pitch snare drums uh, around this area and uh, I am definitely very sensitive to sounds in, in that area so um, no wrong one so now this is what we have now we have absolute like just crazy accuracy compared to <clears throat> compared to a Harman target curve it just smoothed all of this out there's no that you know compared to the actual target it, we're, we're less than half a DB here you know we have a little bit of waviness here this is the speaker uh, but we have uh, compared to the original uh, look at look at the original response you know we're, we're not tracking treble very well at all um, ELAC speakers um, from um, I can't remember his name Jones I can't remember his first name um, he's a very popular someone's gonna tell me who it is um, anyway um, the ELAC speakers that um, that he produced um, at ELAC there um, they they definitely did sound smooth they were smooth speakers you could say and it's because of this roll-off um, there is a little bit of shallowness in early bass is what I'll say for like symphonies but um, if you're if, if, if you know you're demoing uh, kind of dance music uh, that's got this punch here it does sound good right so um, that is definitely one thing to actually think about but again now we've cleared up all of this this potential shallowness in bass early bass here with symphony music and um, one thing this does is that if you put this a sound in just the right speaker or just the left speaker or any of your speakers your Atmos speakers or anything like that because I calibrated all of my speakers this way when you put sounds into those speaker and you isolate just in that speaker it sounds so much better it sounds incredibly crisp another thing I noticed was um, <clears throat> on the Spears and Munsell disc uh, 4k ultra HD disc there's a lot of demos for panning and things like that well not too many but one of the the, 
the demos on there is really good where um, the sound goes from say the front left to the top left Atmos and you can check for differences there in volume and things like that and it's really good but then what happens is uh, a sound comes from the top left Atmos and goes to over the middle of the screen to the back right Atmos speaker. Now I use an Oro 3D layout and over the years not having this level of calibration moving a sound from the front to the rear is almost impossible right and what I mean by that is when the sound is moving across when it gets to the middle the middle I couldn't even I couldn't tell where it was pre-calibration I'm talking no calibration whatsoever no Odyssey's not Odyssey's not even turned on you know none of that and to be honest localizing these sounds is just so difficult but when you have a response like this for your front speaker and you have it for the back right and you have it for every speaker system in in your system the handoff that you get from moving a sound from the front front to the rear and actually placing it in the top middle of the room is unbelievable better than um, better than this actually front average all oh, right that was front average that wasn't the calibration um, average cal it is better than this because average cal kind of doesn't calibration here doesn't really mean anything yes they both they're both equivalent almost to my real individual calibration but playing separately you can hear these differences these these minor inconsistencies here you can actually hear and it really does make difference a, a difference to the, to what you hear if things are within 1 to 2 dB they do make a difference you can hear that um, what am I doing here there we go yeah you can hear that and um, another thing that I found very interesting is um, <clears throat> Uh, pink noise when you measure pink noise um, pink noise I believe is around uh, the peak is about 1k and it probably uh, I don't I'm not 100% sure about this but I think uh, the peak really goes to about 800 Hertz maybe 600 or even 5 and then goes to about 4 or 3 and you get this arc you get this arc right when you measure pink noise um, and depending on where what's happening here in the pink noise range you'll say if there was a dip like imagine there was a dip here because my surround speakers uh, back left uh, surround speakers and back right surround speakers have dips here now or here sorry at 1k uh, by about 1 or 2 dB now again the peak of the pink noise is around there so a lot of the times I was having to increase the volume of my rears to make up for this difference and if you're getting these inconsistencies in this area imagine you have an imperfect uh, response right something like this where it's wavy right in the pink noise range that means you're measuring to 75 dB and it's not really an accurate representation of the true average volume of your speaker um, the, but this is why they put them this is why you put pink noise in the middle here because it is compared to the rest of this right look at this response compared to the rest of this the pink noise in this range is the best place to put it but doing so getting 75 dB from say this uh, speaker here the front left um, you're under tracking treble and in many ways you're actually under tracking bass because of the way the speakers just naturally falling in frequencies so now you have a clean response and a Harman target curve is a curve designed based on how the human ear hears things frequencies so if you're tracking individual speakers tro uh, close to this target unbelievable sound 
you just get unbelievable sound uh, by doing this. And um, it took me a while. <laughs> it took me a while to get on on the train of individual speaker calibration versus um, measuring two speakers at the front, combining them, averaging the response here, EQing that, putting that into the system, applying it to both the left and the right speaker. That's what I was doing before. And now, again, it has been in Odyssey for a while now, probably, probably a year, but um, significantly better much much better and it might also have something to do with the you know this this eq method that we're using here because again i don't eq anymore i just invert a target's response and this is you know uh, and this is what you now get you know you upload this the inverted response of a speaker and then you measure now in uh, rew and you get a perfect response you know so um I have seen a lot of pe other people using um, other correction softwares like Arc and things like that, and uh, well, their responses look nothing like this, right? They, they look nothing like this. Um, they're not tracking anywhere near as close as this. And to be fair, Odyssey by default, and I'm talking the automated system where you plug it in, you plug their microphone into the receiver and it takes all of those measurements, that's terrible as well. Actually, Odyssey might even be one of the worst for automatic calibration. Um, it does speaker impulse response excellently, distances and things like that. It actually does those very, very well. Um, and I actually still use Odyssey's distances that it uh, assigned to the receiver haven't quite looked into that yet and that that really is the next uh thing for me um but it, from what i've seen i have had a look at it in rew um and odyssey odyssey automatic distances and that type of thing it seems to be doing an exceptional job it's very close right it's getting my subwoofers extremely close like within 30.3 0.30 milliseconds like it's extremely close the uh the work that it is actually able to do with just impulse um but its target response is a joke right if you want if you don't want to get involved in uh, eq in any way and you want the system to just manage everything um i i think other room corrections are probably better um, but again, from the responses that I'm seeing, they're not perfect either. They're far from perfect. And the only way you can get this type of response is by doing it yourself. You do it with REW and you import your target curve here. That is the best way to do it. Simple as that. This actually shows you as well. I don't know if I, I have talked about this, but the uh, red, red response here is the right speaker. So just look how much brighter the the right speaker is than my left you know there was a massive difference and no other channel had this right the surround backs they're roughly tracking around the same type of treble right uh surround backs roughly the same type of treble heights eh, maybe that there's some differences there right with my heights they are you know connected to the wall they're drilled onto the wall and maybe there's some definite reflections going on there, but even even the right, the rear the rear heights they're not too far off. But this difference is massive, and this is again why individual speaker calibration is is so beneficial uh, to clear up any weird things going on like this. So, yeah, um, I'm extremely happy um, with this. Somebody mentioned. Um, on one of my, I'm not, I, I won't even dare uh, say the name because I, I've, I probably, uh, I can't remember it. But somebody on uh, one of my videos, maybe six videos ago, said um, you should definitely try EQing individually. And um, well, I responded to him and I said, you know, um, yeah, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, it, you can get better results because um, I, I tried a quick calibration. And, uh, you know, I, 
I was using an old EQ method and it, it just, I didn't personally like the sound of it. But now, now doing it with this method about inverting, you know, you know, your target's response and things like that. Tremendous. You know, it's just mind boggling sound that you can get from 1200, you know, my front speakers are $1,200, you know, um, they're really, you know, they're ELAC Unify speakers and uh, they're soft, but they have nice kick, uh, kick bass. Um, when you see that response, though, the original response, um, they're relatively different, decent music speakers, I'll say, because, um, and the reason I say that is because um, they have nice kick drum uh, here, or, uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't go that far, but it's good for dance music. Like this music, it's actually good for dance music because rolling off this treble isn't too bad, you know, with that. It actually sounds quite nice. It sounds warm, you could say. It's a warm sounding speaker. It's not a bright sounding speaker. Um, in many ways, um, certain types of music could actually sound fairly decent with this. But it's just the fact of the inconsistency, you know, having this type of consistency the entire way down a Harman curve is just, uh, you know, it is, uh, it's, it's special. It really is. Um, I've played all sorts of, uh, up from music to movies, uh, to back to Queen. No rattling, harsh, I wouldn't say that there was no harshness anyway. Over brightness is, is the word I'm using here. And if anything, as well, um, this response has made the speakers less bright, which is very interesting to me because um, <clears throat> it's made me think about my volume levels uh, again. And when you when you don't have speakers that sound harsh, brittle, too much br overly bright, you feel as though you can turn the sound up even more. Like I can go higher in volume and it doesn't hurt my ears. Like there's none of that. There's nothing going on anymore. So, um, yeah, very impressed. Um, uh, if you have not done an individual speaker calibration yet, um, I strongly advise it because the results you can get, if you are ever, ever having a treble, a potential treble issues with uh, sound ringing in your ear and things like that, and you're just thinking, the first thought again I had was, well, I want to change this target curve. I think it's too bright, but it actually wasn't that at all. It's just getting individual speaker calibration can correct for all of this, all of these problems that you have. So, yeah. Um, one thing as well with, um, with, uh, this, uh, front, let's do center, um, my EQ, so in, you import, uh, targets from text, right? They're text files and you can export these from REW and put them into your, uh, receiver, uh, my Denon here with, with the, uh, with this multi EQX app. What I like to do though, is just at this point where the speaker is starting to, uh, well, the response curve, we'll say, is starting to boost, I manually edit that code and set it all to zero. What that does is it means the speaker is going to naturally roll off, right? This is where the speaker rolls off, right? All of my speakers, because all the woofers are the same, roll off at 60 hertz. And that now doesn't change either. So if you see this, this is the original response. And look, yes, it's got this peak here, but we've controlled that. But look at the speaker, it's rolling off in, in exactly the same way. And it's because of this, it's because of this code. Um, and again, as soon as I see a positive number here, that is the point where now we, we edit all of this data um, with uh, Google Sheets. Uh, which is on one of my previous videos, um, if anyone does want to see that, the way I did it. Um, again, I got that from uh, OCA uh, on uh, his YouTube video uh, about that you can use a spreadsheet to, you know, change numbers and organize numbers. And I was like, wow, that's, uh, 
that's really cool. Well, I'm going to start doing that. But uh, another thing is my treble rolls off. Right? Um, left surround. My treble here, look, rolls off. And I've done that personally. I've edited the i edited the code at the end to make sure treble rolls off. I'm not boosting uh, treble above 20k because I don't feel as though it's worth worth doing so in the amplifier or processor or whatever you're tr whatever you're using. I don't think it's worth it. Um, an example. Let's see if I can find an example. Uh, so this is like back left around. Okay. So again, it includes this code, right, that uh, is 0 dB, and that's what you saw just now. Uh, I do this for every speaker because, again, this was the lowest negative number we got, and that was at 53. Most of the speakers are about the same, right? They're using the same woofers. Even the floor standards uh, are roughly the same, right? We might be there to get to 51, but, you know, that is where that compared to a Harman target curve is where the speaker is uh, is rolling off. Um, <clears throat> so, um, right, good example here. So um, the back surrounds, right, um, around 20k, right, around here, around 18k, we are boosting, this is not a negative number, this is 1.6, right, we're boosting by 1.6 to keep in track with a Harman target curve. These speakers, as you've seen on some of the responses by their default, is rolling off. It's starting to taper off. It's having uh, almost like a cinema EQ, if you know what that is, or an X curve, uh, which is which is true cinema equalization. It's almost rolling off that way, and this really stops that. Um, I understand why a lot of speaker manufacturers do that, uh, because especially, I'm going to use the word cheaper speakers. Um, bookshelf speakers, you know, that type of size, it makes a speak it can make a speaker without any EQ sound smooth and clean, right? It can. But com again, compared to a Harman target curve, we are boosting here, you know, 18 hertz, so this is 2 dB plus 2 dB. Now, treble doesn't require as much power as, um, you know, bass, but, um, you know, there are things to consider here uh, with that. I mean, how far do you go? Human hearing is t is really to 20k, right? You know, um, and here's another thing. My response was to 24k, and I did this purposely because I'm also using target curves that go all the way to 24k because Odyssey is in a 24-bit 48 kilohertz system, right? And I think a lot of uh, systems are also like that. Um, I think ARC actually goes to like 96 or now even 192. I'm screaming overkill. Um, now thinking about this, like uh, you don't, honestly, I you don't need above 24 bit 48, in my opinion, right? If Odyssey made an update and they said, yeah, Odyssey can now go um, to 24 bit 192, I'm telling you right now, you will not, with my speakers, you wouldn't hear a difference in the calibration at all um, because I have heard them claim, not claiming, but, um, you know, I was here in an interview with uh, the people that made uh, Arc uh, Genesis and stuff like that and other EQs, you know, it's not just them, and getting their resolution above certain numbers. And it's really, for me, just a selling point because uh, anything above this, anything above 24 hertz is is just total overkill, right? And again, look. I want you to look at this. Look at my speaker's natural response. It's going down, right? And after 20K, it just, it drops. It just completely drops. So again, what I'm trying to say here is be, a re be realistic with what your um, EQ is doing, right? Sure, we want to go 24-bit 40, uh, 24 bit 48 but it's uh 24 hertz right half of the sample rate we want to try and achieve that but i didn't i felt no it's too much because the reason is is because when you this is 20 this this is 20k this is being now boosted by 2.7k this is still at reasonable numbers when we get into 24 hertz though we're boosting by 8 db i'm not doing that no 
it's not worth it. That is not worth, I'm telling you right now, that, that, that level of EQ up to 24 is not worth it. Um, so what I did was I wanted my speaker again, as you can see in the EQs, they're rolling off naturally. I would say they're, 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 they're rolling down, right? So if there is anything to 24K, it's, it's tapering down, you know? I'm not saying there is. Uh, there is information there, but my speakers are, I'm telling you now, they're not going to do it, and my, my ears can't even hear that. Uh, so, what I did was, and uh, this is something I worked out with uh, screwing up, essentially, a bass curve, right? Um, when I first started EQ in this way, I didn't know how to finish EQs off, because how, at least in Odyssey, and I think, I'm assuming other EQs do this, is... If you don't fill in the rest of the information from 20K to 24, the only thing it can do is finish off the curve in a way in the direction that it was going, right? So here's what I did. I edited this and this was 20, like 16, and then a bunch of numbers here, right? So what I did was I set it to 20K exactly just in case um, on Odyssey as well, I've got my limit all. Uh, what you can set it to is limit all, which makes it so EQs only go up to 20 hertz, only, or 20 kilohertz. You can do that. So what I did was, is uh, this number, the, so this number is 27. This number's 28. We're boosting, right? So we're going, we're going up in, in a fashion that is the fashion we're going in. I wanted to change that. I wanted to change its direction. How you do that is I just mirrored the number above it, 2.757, and I did 2.757. What that does is on every single EQ now, here, filter, everything always arcs down now. It finishes at 20K and arcs down. Uh, front height. I mean, we have to, we're having to raise treble quite a bit here by 5 dB. But again, look, um, this line, again, it doesn't say here, but this line is 20K, right? This line is 20K. And what is happening to the EQ is it's coming down. Um, front height, same thing, coming down. And again, they're flat. This is where the speaker again comes here. So I'm just thinking about ways of looking after an amplifier, looking after a receiver, and looking after a processor, and not pushing things too hard. Pushing sub bass in a speaker, not a subwoofer, beyond its capability is not worth it. And the same with treble, you want to be careful. Up to 20k though, I thought, around up to 20k, I'm fine with, right? 18, 20k, you've got really nice treble, tracks perfectly again to a Harman target. Uh, let's look here, you know, we're tracking perfectly here, all the way up to, I mean, 19 point, we're at 20k there, right? The speakers track perfectly up to 20k. Human hearing. That was my goal. And, uh, yeah, so I just wanted to explain even a little about that, um, you know, the, the, what you can do here. Um, you know, using a, a spreadsheet, uh, this is what I was doing here. You know, I'm using it. This is the these the these are the base responses, right? 11, 12, 15, 20, 20. You know, all the way up to my number, uh, which was 50. Yeah, about 50 hertz on most of the speakers. You can split the code here of the numbers, um, so uh, now you can get access to uh, the actual volumes here, and you can copy these, right? Now. And this is why they can't, this is why they import with a space at the top there. It's um, this is the space of the column, right? It's between here, I believe. Um, but in Odyssey, it doesn't matter. The, Odyssey doesn't see this space. It just sees one space, like the rest of them, and it imports perfectly. So, yeah. So yeah, just some of the stuff I've been working on um, lately, and. Uh, this might be my final EQ. I've said that in the past before, but you know, <laughs> I have said that before, and uh, it no, it wasn't uh, because again, you get really obsessive about this. Um, you know, what what else can I do? So, um, but yeah, that's the video, and um, you know, 
it's really hopefully showing people that individual speaker calibration can achieve much much better results um yeah well i've um interestingly um I, what i will leave you with is um i also recalibrated my sub that's oh, just come out of that uh with a new method and uh let me see if we can go into it I'll just show you the response. So um, I've been working on different ways to calibrate the sub. And um, because I I was always getting, in Odyssey, I was always getting this, um, you know, being boosted here by however many dB to get things back. And I felt as though I could do a better job. And as well, I uh, looked at um, obsessive compulsive uh audio file did a video about how um, impulse response on a subwoofer is different compared to all the other speakers right and um, interestingly enough I actually calibrated this way originally uh, with mini DSP uh, but with Odyssey what I did was I was like well let me get in the impulses completely perfect right when one speaker is being played and heard, I want the other speaker to be played and heard as well. Unfortunately, that does not give you the best bass. It does not. Um, does not give you the best bass at all, and it doesn't give you the smoothest bass. Um, yeah, I've been trying all these others. So um, this was an interesting one, a 10 dB rise with a Fletcher curve. Very interesting. Um, I tried one with um, a Harman target curve. Uh, I didn't it, it sounded fine, you know, it sounded fine, um, but nothing compared to this. So let's load this up. So this is with an REW room curve method that I made. And um, let's see if I can just show you the response. Uh, let's go to the sub. Um, all right, sub. Unclick everything. Clear all. And uh, yeah, it's uh, insane. That's the best subwoofer. That's the best subwoofer response I've gotten in my house over the last three years. And again, this is coming from someone that said with um, Mini DSP that I'd hit the jackpot with Mini DSP, and you couldn't you couldn't get this type of response. Um, so at 100, let's do 100 hertz, right? At 100 Hz, we're at 75 dB, and here at 25 Hz, we're at 83. So it's about, on average, about 8 dB, right? And again, it's this, these numbers aren't coming out of uh, thin air, they are because of a reason. Um, and yeah, it is. Um, Incredible bass, <laughs> absolutely amazing bass uh, with this new method. Um, really, really happy with it. I've just been watching people's videos and taking things that I like about uh, what people do, certain things, and just combining them as in uh, for one EQ method that I, that I now used. Um, it did take two EQs to get this as well which is great again with um, <clears throat> uh, with oh, there's loads of them so I can't show them all but again with uh, Odyssey here uh, multi EQX you can put as many filters in as you want you could put 50 filters for one channel if you really wanted to you know you can do anything that you want uh, with this so yeah uh, again I've got to the point now where I don't I mean when you see a subwoofer response like that clean all the way up to 25 25 hertz and then its speaker naturally rolls off which it should you know um you're always going to have a good bass as long as you have the power you know yeah you, you need the you obviously need the power to do this um but yeah i was getting like i was getting like a big dip in problem here like when you impulse a lion um you know, I just couldn't, you can't correct for that, 
you can't I was trying I was trying to EQ correct for that but you you know you really can't do it um, there's a little going on here but um, you know it's uh, it's corrected for a lot of errors and you just really get a super smooth uh, response now so I think I'll put that in for another video and I might even do like a full calibration explaining how to get a subwoofer this clean in response so yeah lots going on but hopefully I have honestly got my system now to a point where I can leave the calibration for a bit because um, you know I need to start catching up on like uh, reviews um, you know even even like uh, you know responding to be people on like Twitter and stuff like that and like uh, the comments and stuff like that I've been putting on the back burner because like uh, I just wanted to make sure 100% my system was where it wanted to be. Everything sounded good. Uh, each individual movie sounded good. There wasn't too bright things going on. And once I heard that and that movie that sounded too bright, I was like, I need to change something. Thought, let's try an individual calibration. And it worked. Um, it vastly improved my results. And... Uh, yeah, last Saturday I watched a couple of videos on YouTube. I watched Obsessive Compulsive, uh, one of his videos about sub, how to align the sub and don't think about it in an impulse way. Think about it in just the responses way. And yeah, this is actually how I did my mini DSP. Um, it was very similar to this, but again, I don't think mini DSP allowed me to get it this fine. Uh, mini DSP... Though I now, somebody responded to me on YouTube and said, you can do this, but you have to like combine the file. Um, if you were trying to stack an EQ, you can combine the file from a an EQ and then another EQ, and then you can just combine the, re the results, input them as one, and then, then you'd be able to stack them like this and probably get exactly the same results. But the fact that you can do it in Odyssey here, multi EQX app, you can do it all manually. You don't need a mini DSP. Is so because I was always wondering, like, my subs don't really sound quite as good as my mini DSP. I felt not now, not now with this method. You know, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. It's it. It's either better or exactly the same as the Mini DSP. And in many ways, because I didn't know how to stack EQs back then in Mini DSP, and you can stack EQs in here, um, you just get gorgeous bass response. Absolutely gorgeous. So, yeah, very happy with this whole system. Um, yeah. If anyone else is uh, going through this, like they're learning, not just, to be honest, you don't have to use multi EQX. If you're just learning how to EQ full range speakers and have them sound good, um, what, you know, what have you gone through in the past, you know, with have you calibrated both speakers uh, on an average and then you found individual speaker cali calibration to be better? Uh, it took me a while, but I'm really glad I'm here now. Um, you know, the, the response I'm getting from my speakers and now my subs. I th This is the best I've ever had my room sound. And I, th I think, I think I've reached the cap of the performance of my receiver, my subs and my speakers. I think. I might be making another video in six months saying, whoa, drop everything. We've found a new method. But I don't... I think I think we're I think that's it. I think I've hit the actual limit of the performance of what of the gear that I have. So yeah, super happy. And uh, yeah, if you're in this very similar situation where you're you're doing this and uh, you're just learning, 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 and you've just kind of hit the jackpot of sound for your system, you know, let me know. And uh, uh, I just want to. It's just nice talking to other people that, you know, experience this and go through the same thing. And again, this is this is like manual calibration, you know. This is not just running Odyssey and, you know, letting Odyssey do its thing and, hey, it sounds okay or, uh, or bad in certain situations. You know, it sounds worse. 
this is doing everything by yourself, learning by yourself, using, you know, a spreadsheet to finish off EQ filters, using AI. Uh, in one of my other videos, I showed how AI can finish off curves for you. You know, like, um, I just don't ever think that a um, automated EQ system, unless you're at trim off levels, maybe, that you're going to get this. I just, you know. But uh, I don't have $16,000 to spend on just a processor. Uh, you know, I don't, right? I'm thinking about upgrading my uh, receiver to the new Denon flagship, which is 7000 You know, that type of cost is in my ballpark. And I, I don't know how much more sound quality that I could gain above this. So, you know. That's next. I'm also gonna save up probably probably for a new TV. You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a new a lot of upgrades. I want an OLED 83 inch, but for me, um, it's not the time to buy yet. Um, the upgrades. I have an LG C9, and the uh, I'm telling you now, the upgrades are just not big enough. They're not good enough for me to upgrade my C9. I have a 75 inch, uh, 77, 77 inch C9, and uh, it's not just not time to upgrade, you know. My C9 is professionally calibrated, and it just looks absolutely gorgeous, you know. So, am I going to spend five thousand dollars on a new TV? What am I gaining? Sure, they have improved black levels um, every single year, but the one of the big black level improvements was like with the CX, right? Uh, it allowed more fine adjustments in black level detail. Sure. But I still feel as though the difference is still too small. And that's why I'm like holding out. 2024, 2025, I think is going to be the year to upgrade. Because uh, I heard, uh, I've heard some rumors that there's some good stuff coming. So, uh, all right, that's enough for me today. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, yeah, calibration never seems to stop. I'm always learning new things. And that is the fun part about this. So uh, yeah, I do appreciate you watching and uh, have a great day. Thanks. Bye.